Good afternoon. Uh, let me first of all thank you, uh, Jean, for that uh, very, very uh, generous uh, introduction. Um, I, I think after that introduction, anything that I'm going to say is going to disappoint you. Um, I, I'll try to disappoint you a little bit less um, than, uh, than what uh, you set me up for. <laughs> um, thank you also, um, Aiden, for chairing the session and, and uh, um, Richard for the original invitation. It's, it's, very, it's very, very nice to be here. Um, I will be uh, talking about um, uh, two big uh, topics, uh, globalization and, and populism and, and how uh, they are related. Uh, as Jean mentioned, it's, it's a question that I've, I've, um, uh, I've long been interested in. Um, where is the, uh, how do I control the slides here? Is it? Thank you. Um, uh, it is, um, uh, go populism of course has, has come to the forefront uh, in 2016 with the election of Trump and with the Brexit vote. Uh, but I think it, it, it's, it's fair to say that uh, the undercurrents of um, uh, the populist backlash um, have been around for quite some time. This is one way to, to, uh, to see it if you simply look at the vote share of uh, parties that are uh, uh, conventionally categorized as, as populist. Uh, if you look at their vote share, uh, it's something uh, that has been uh, actually increasing since the 80s and 90s. So in that sense, um, we should not have been surprised necessarily uh, by what happened in, in 2016. Um, so th this picture uh, suggests uh, essentially two things. One is that um, this is something that's been going on for a while. It's not just the, um, the Great Recession or the global financial crisis or the Euro crisis, although without question that has um, aggravated uh, the pressures. Um, it also suggests that this is um, uh, quite a, a, a global uh, phenomenon, that it's something that's really going on that cuts across countries. So uh, I think we need to be uh, skeptical about explanations that rely too much on the specificities uh, of a single country. I think this is especially true in the country that I come from in the United States where I think um, uh, without diminishing uh, the ex extremely important role that the racial divide plays, I think there's an excessive tendency to emphasize um, uh, racism and the racial divide in explaining uh, the, um, the, uh, the rise of Trumpism and, and similar forces um, uh, when one looks at, at sort of very similar um, movements afoot um, everywhere in a lot of other countries where the divides uh, tend to be somewhat different. Um, so I want to, to really do um, two things uh, in my talk. Um, one is uh, to suggest that, um, you know, I was less prescient than Jean made it sound. That is that when back in 1997 when I wrote Has Globalization Gone Too Far and talking about the tensions uh, that are going to, uh, that were going to uh, uh, potentially uh, erupt. Um, uh, I was looking into the future, but I was also, I think, um, uh, very solidly based on uh, what economics teaches. Um, and I think I'm going to suggest to you that we should not have been surprised just from the perspective of, of very standard economic theory, what it says uh, about uh, what the advanced stages of globalization and the kind of divisions that uh, advanced stages of globalization uh, spawn. So in a, in a kind of you know, odd way, you know, sort of economists always want to take credit, you know, even when, you know, sort of for, for even for the wrong things or for the bad things. So in a way, I'm going to be stealing a little bit of credit for the economics discipline in the rise of populism uh, in, in, in a lot of, of what I'm, I'm going to be uh, saying. But I think I, I, the second thing I want to do is also underscore that, uh, that you can't simply understand what's happening uh, uh, by focusing on the economic anxieties or the divisions that globalization uh, has spawned. Uh, you have to also understand what I call uh, the supply side. Uh, that is in my, in my uh, very simple story, uh, globalization is the result of, sort of, uh, of, of, of divisions and anxieties, economic difficulties, um, uh, that then get framed on the supply side by 
uh, prevalent, uh, uh, by prevailing uh, cleavages and prevailing framing, often in cultural terms, uh, by uh, political entrepreneurs, by parties, political leaders. And, and that, will ask, that will lead me to ask the question, uh, why is it that this framing, uh, even if the underlying cause, uh, that, that background economic conditions are similar across countries, why is it that this framing um, uh, uh, has taken different forms uh, in, different, in different kinds of countries? Um, and I will, uh, in particular, focus on the, uh, the left versus right wing populism uh, in, in, in their different framing in different countries. So that's, uh, that's, that's the agenda. Um, uh, the uh, globalization um, has you know, almost always caused kind of, of, of backlash uh, at different uh, stages in history. Um, the, the very first uh, self-consciously populist movement in history uh, was the U.S. People's Party, uh, sometimes also called uh, populist, uh, the Populist Party, uh, that was, uh, um, grew up in the 1880s out of farmers' alliances in the southern and western parts of the United States. And of course, the most important uh, spokesman uh, of, the, of the People's Party turned out to be John uh, William B B Jennings Bryan. Uh, who famously uh, said at the 1896 uh, Democratic Convention, said, you will not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Uh, the target was the gold standard, um, and he was railing, and essentially uh, populist at the time, uh, took target against the gold standard, uh, the most visible aspect of 19th century, an early flowering of globalization. And, and that was largely because of what the perception that globalization was producing what in today's terms we would call austerity politics, or the politics of austerity, uh, that it was causing uh, price deflation, uh, farm prices were low, it was causing relatively high real interest rates, uh, resulting in very large debt burden on the part of farmers, and it was privileged, it was promoted uh, by a set of financial interest in New York and in northeastern parts of the country. Uh, that then became uh, the cleavage uh, which the populists um, tried to, to, uh, to target. And even though um, uh, the populists then uh, did not get very far in politics, uh, Brian himself was, never got elected president, um, in large part, in some part at least, because uh, farm prices recovered as uh, uh, gold prices uh, fell. Um, and, uh, but many of the ideas of these early populists eventually became part of the um, uh, policies of the United States through the progressive era and ultimately actually in the new, uh, in the new deal with much greater business regulation. And it was eventually FDR that took uh, uh, um, the United States out of the gold standard uh, to reflate the economy. Um, so history clearly suggests uh, this link. Um, between um, globalization and, 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 and the backlash. What I want to focus on, though, is, is what uh, economic theory uh, says to explain uh, this link, uh, this, this, uh, this linkage. And I'm going to focus mostly on, on questions of, of trade and, and, and trade economics, but I'll say a little bit about financial globalization as well, uh, which indeed plays a big role. Uh, so um, what does economics actually say about globalization? Uh, first with respect to the distributional impacts of trade. Uh, you know, there's, when, whenever we teach trade, uh, we say uh, essentially um, two things. Uh, we emphasize the first one a lot more than the second one. The first one is that there are gains to trade. Countries that open up to trade um, experience an improvement uh, in the overall level of standards, the economic pie expense. The second thing that we say, perhaps not as loudly, is that uh, trade, opening up to trade, comes with uh, distributional effects. Uh, and it's not just that some gain and some lose relative to each other, it's just that in most of the frameworks of trade that we work in, uh, there are necessarily absolute losses for certain groups. That's just standard uh, trade theory. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but I want to emphasize a, thir a third thing, uh, which is actually the implication of the standard economics that we use. Um, and that one rarely ever gets to be mentioned. I'm not sure it's, 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 it's well recognized, but it's a, it's a fundamental uh, implication of standard economic theory, uh, which actually has a lot to do uh, with this relationship between ad advanced globalization and the populist backlash. And the, sec and the third point uh, is that uh, 
the, if you will, the, the share, the, the redistribution uh, tends to loom larger and larger relative to the gains from trade, um, the more advanced we are in stages of globalization. That is to say, that's just a, um, a standard result of public finance theory, which is that the uh, economic or the efficiency cost of high barriers or high taxes are disproportionately large, but as these taxes get to be low, uh, their efficiency costs also correspondingly become disproportionately smaller. And what that means is that essentially um, the redistributive effects uh, tend to loom particularly large uh, when you start going after barriers that are very low or you go, start going after barriers or, or after areas of liberalization where the net gains are actually quite ambiguous. Um, now, let me say something about the second aspect, the second point, the redistribution. Uh, here, of course, the, the most well-known result is the famous Stolper-Samuelson theorem, which says, in a very specific context, that uh, some parts of the economy uh, will definitely be in worse off in absolute terms from the opening up of trade uh, in the standard model that's either labor or unskilled labor. And sometimes this result is poo-pooed by saying, well, you know, it's just a, such a specific, uh, such a um, uh, specific model with very specific assumptions uh, that uh, it may not actually necessarily generalize. Uh, but there's a version of the Stolper-Samuelson which generalizes quite nicely, which is to say that uh, that as long as you have some import production uh, that is com competing with imports, as long, in other words, as long as imports have not completely replaced domestic production. Uh, then there is always going to be, always going to be at least one factor of production, one group that's going to be absolutely worse off, uh, absolutely worse off from the opening of trade. So these divisions are actually quite stark, directly predicted from theory, and are, are, are general implications um, uh, from the theory that we use. But the third point is the one that I'm, I'm, I'm even more interested in, which is sort of this ratio of the amount of redistribution that takes place relative to the net gains or to the efficiency gains. Uh, so heuristically, some years ago, I defined this, this uh, uh, ratio, which I call the political cost-benefit ratio of any price reform. But let's think about it here in terms of trade liberalization. And very crudely, this is the, this is the ratio of the absolute amount of redistribution that takes place uh, uh, relative to the net gains, uh, or in the case of trade, uh, the net gains uh, from trade. Um, so, uh, the, as I said uh, earlier, uh, the implication of what I said earlier, that redistribution tends to loom uh, uh, larger uh, as uh, the barriers that we go after tend to become smaller, uh, is that this ratio, the PCBR, rises uh, as trade liberalization tackles progressively lower barriers. Um, and the reason for that, as I indicated earlier, is, has to do with this um, nonlinearity um, of, um, of the economic uh, uh, gains from liberalization. Uh, and that small liberalization, liberalization of small barriers actually tend to produce uh, a, much more, um, a much more important distributive effects relative to efficiency effects. Now, um, the, uh, the, uh, this might seem just like a, a kind of a theoretical point with relatively uh, small empirical uh, import. First, uh, just to give you a sense of how large the magnitudes uh, involved are, let me run you through simply the results of a couple of numerical simulations just to, to, um, to get you to think about what the magnitudes of redistribution we're talking about relative to efficiency gains, uh, just so that we understand why sometimes trade liberalization or globalization can be so politically uh, 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 disruptive. Uh, in the simplest partial equilibrium uh, uh, presentation of the gains from trade, uh, where we're opening up the markets uh, and domestic producers lose and domestic consumers gain, we can simply calculate this ratio of the uh, uh, distribution of the amount of redistribution relative to efficiency gain. Uh, it turns out that it depends on three parameters. Uh, the, um, the share of imports in domestic consumption, uh, the price elasticity of import demand, and the size of the trade barriers uh, that is being eliminated in the first place. Um, and this ratio, as you can see from the last column of the table, uh, rises uh, from five when uh, tariffs are, I've made some uh, assumptions that go against me with respect to mu and epsilon, 
but when initial tariffs are 40%, that is relatively large, uh, this number is around five. When we go to um, uh, tariff levels that are 10% or below, this ratio already reaches 20. Just think what 20 means. That $20 of income are being reshuffled in the economy across different groups for $1 of net gain that is being generated. Uh, just, just implication of, of the very standard models that we teach. Uh, is, this, is this something that's just because this is a simple partial equilibrium uh, framework? It's not. We can do the same in a general equilibrium. Uh, have more than sort of have a couple of goods, two factors of production. This is actually uh, just the Stolt for Samuelson framework. We do the same analysis, uh, this, essentially the same exercise, and what we get is that the amount of redistribution that is generated uh, per dollars of uh, net gains uh, are, are rise inordinately uh, when tariffs get to the levels of what we have currently. Um, uh, in terms of the um, um, the actual effects of trade agreements that are negotiated, moving from simulations uh, to uh, the uh, uh, empirical work that has looked at actual um, trade agreements. Uh, the results we get actually are not too sim dissimilar. I'm, su I'm sure you actually cannot get uh, these, um, you cannot see uh, the actual numbers, but if you look at some of the best work uh, that evaluates NAFTA after the fact, what you get is exactly what economic theory says. Relatively large import or trade volume effects, uh, quite small uh, efficiency gains for the United States as a whole. That's because the United States was already fairly open to Mexico when NAFTA was signed. Um, and with respect to uh, you know, distributional effects, uh, we get very <coughs> significant distributional effects on certain segments of the labor force. In particular, when we look at the United States, communities that were directly competing uh, with Mexican imports, and they were particularly affected by a reduction on tariffs on Mexican goods, uh, experienced very significant reductions in incomes and earnings relative to other communities, um, and that, in fact, these income losses that were suffered by workers in these communities essentially translate into large income losses uh, for the uh, communities in which they live in, too, as well. So you weren't necessarily protected if you were in the non-tradable uh, sectors, if you lived, if your non-tradable business uh, was in a community where, in fact, a lot of workers were in these particular kinds of, of, of tradables. So a small group of workers uh, was hit very hard. Uh, there is similar, much better known on the implications of China's entry into the World Trade Organization, uh, work by David Autor at MIT and, and, and co-authors, uh, who find very large uh, sustained employment and wage effects in hard-hit communities. That is, communities that found themselves particularly um, uh, competing with, um, uh, with uh, Chinese imports. This new generation of work uh, that is very much sort of driven by labor economists differs from earlier work that didn't find very significant distributional effects from trade opening. And I think the big difference with this empirical work is that actually it does the labor, the labor economics of it very much more carefully. In other words, it distinguishes between local labor markets and the national labor markets. And therefore, there are additional margins of redistribution, which turns out to be very significant because labor markets, it turns out, even in the United States, are not as nationally integrated uh, as, uh, as, as one would have thought um, uh, uh, originally. So this is the reason why this new generation of work on the distributional incidence of trade agreements is unco uncovering much deeper impacts uh, on redistribution than the earlier work, which tended to aggregate labor and just dealing between, let's say, two categories of labor, skilled versus unskilled, that didn't find uh, significant, uh, significant impacts. Um, so uh, the first point, therefore, is, is that we shouldn't be surprised because trade has very large distributional effects and these distributional effects become significantly large. Trade begins to look, trade agreements like even NAFTA, but more subsequently like TPP, uh, starts to look essentially uh, redistributive uh, arrangement rather than one that is uh, increasing the overall economic pie. The second point, uh, which uh, I had already emphasized uh, two decades ago um, in 1997, uh, is, and, and, and Jean uh, alluded to this work, is that when we look at cross countries, one of the uh, interesting regularities we see uh, is that countries that opened up the most to trade uh, also were the ones that were the most generous 
uh, in terms of providing social insurance and the welfare state. Um, and that's why that's the case of Scandinavia or Central European countries that on the one hand are very open to trade, high degrees of exposure to trade, and also very extensive uh, welfare states. I've always interpreted this as a kind of a, sort of a flip side between the welfare state uh, and, and the open economy, that countries open themselves up to globalization, but in turn demand social insurance and safety nets, and uh, European countries have tended to provide these safety nets in the form of unconditional uh, access to a welfare state, unlike the United States, uh, which tries to deal with it in highly imperfect trade adjustment assistance mechanisms. Uh, but what has happened uh, is that, again, in the advanced stages of uh, um, globalization, this link between exposure to trade um, uh, and safety nets begin to unravel. And we see this, again, most clearly in the United States, because the United States is a relatively late uh, uh, opener uh, to trade. And the United States could have gone uh, the European route, uh, but it didn't. Uh, in, in fact, the greater opening of the United States to low-income countries like, NAFTA, like, like Mexico originally and subsequently to China took place in the context of fraying safety nets rather than more extensive safety nets. And we see the differences in terms of their political consequences that today, even today, despite the opposition to other aspects of globalization in Europe, uh, trade with low-wage countries is not a political issue in the United States, uh, in Europe, I'm sorry. Whereas in the United States, trade with low-wage countries like Mexico and China is very much a political issue. And that, I think, is linked with the uh, much um, uh, 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 thinner uh, so social insurance mechanisms uh, in, in the United States. Um, so what, one thing that happens in the advanced stages of globalization is that it becomes harder to generate the tax base with which you're going to pro fund the welfare state. So in the advanced stages of hyper-globalization, as capital becomes, and professionals, and skilled individuals, and, co and companies become more mobile, uh, it becomes harder to fund the welfare state. And therefore, this co link between uh, increased globalization and, inc and generosity of the welfare state becomes weakened because taxes have to move away from uh, you know, corporations and the skilled and, and mobile parts of the economy, those precisely who benefit from globalization, to the immobile parts of the economy. And you've seen this in the European context uh, with the transition uh, towards consumption taxes, VATs, um, which are disproportionately borne by, uh, by, by, by uh, uh, workers. Um, but there was also an ideological shift. I need to say that this wasn't just because the welfare state became harder to fund, it was also uh, that the 80s and 1990s were a period uh, when uh, uh, it, you know, people became convinced that the government should do less. Uh, so in the United States, it was much harder to sell uh, social insurance and social programs. Um, the third thing that, that uh, you know, we, we uh, um, I think is a newer issue that I think economists have only now really, our, this is in some sense economics has, has lagged behind. Um, earlier I mentioned that um, Europe uh, trade with low-income countries has not been a big political issue. Uh, that doesn't mean that trade agreements are easier to sign in Europe, as you well know, but uh, the political opposition to trade agreement in Europe has taken a very different form that really focuses much more on the fact um, that um, this is not what I want to talk about. This is the one I want to talk about. Maybe I'll skip that, that third slide. Um, that the, the, the kind of trade agreements have evolved into agreements that are much more about rules behind the border. Uh, so it's you know, less and less about tariffs and quotas because, as I already indicated, those have become small uh, and uh, the net gains uh, are not that big. And where the big income uh, uh, gains, are, where the big potential uh, improvements in terms of market access are, is really reducing barriers behind the border. And these are issues about uh, um, uh, rules and regulations behind the, har behind the border. And this is a transition to what my colleague uh, um, Robert Lawrence has called from shallow to deep integration, that economies are integrating with each other, not simply by reducing barriers at the border, but trying to harmonize their behind the border regulations uh, because those are viewed as transactions costs that impede international trade and investment. But then 
uh, does raise the questions about who decides, uh, who makes those rules, who decides what patent and copyright rules are going to be, who's going to decide what the health and safety and environmental rules are, uh, who decides what are the kinds of protections that uh, investors are going to get. As these have become increasingly the domain of trade negotiators and have been negotiated uh, in the context of trade agreements, I think the popular opposition uh, has, has risen and these has become the salience of trade agreements has increased precisely because of a clash not in terms of purely income redistribution, but a clash in terms of values, in terms of uh, values of, 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 of uh, you know, uh, uh, national sovereignty, values of trying to maintain high levels of, of social and other labor and other standards vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, um, the race uh, to the bottom. Uh, so for a different kind of reason, these kinds of trade agreements have become to be seen uh, less and less as efficiency enhancing agreements. After all, what you see are essentially pharmaceutical companies, multinational corporations, international banks, and investors lobbying for very specific clauses that are going to give them uh, particular benefits, sometimes frankly just monopoly rents in the case of, of uh, pharmaceutical companies um, uh, in the context of uh, TRIPS or trade-related intellectual property rights, which is uh, a big misnomer uh, um, uh, in terms of, of framing a monopoly rent issue in terms of property rights, but, but essentially they won that battle and these have become part of, of, of trade agreements. Um, but in any case, these have become to be seen as essentially rent-seeking arrangements where particular corporate interests are able to get rules to their liking and, and these negotiations happen with relatively little uh, deliberation and open participation uh, in, uh, at the level of, of, of national, uh, national politics. Um, the, in the area of, of, of financial globalization, I, I, may, I will say less because I think the problems, the apparent problems of financial globalization have become uh, much more uh, apparent and clear because when financial globalization goes wrong, it simply blows up in your face in a way that you cannot avoid it. Uh, trade is the forces that sow discord and cleavages and divisions in society, those are uh, less, trans less transparent and, 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 and slower. Uh, but the, in principle, of course, financial globalization presents very much the same kind of, of overall benefits uh, that globalization uh, has the, uh, financial globalization in principle has the advantage that it would channel uh, savings to countries where returns are higher, enables intertemporal consumption, uh, and uh, allow, allows much better global, uh, global portfolio diversification. Those are the three, fine, three uh, important economic benefits uh, which, was, um, uh, which was, was used uh, as arguments for promoting financial globalization. And financial globalization essentially was uh, uh, the thing in the 1990s and, and, and later as, as, as a capital controls and capital account regulations moved from being essentially the norm uh, to the exception and the, and, 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 and the policies that needed to be removed. Um, I think uh, uh, there has been in recent years a significant uh, revaluation of the benefits of financial globalization um, and, uh, and, and, and this is reflected not just in international institutions as the IMF but also in the economics profession uh, as well. And the standard argument there now of, of what essentially has gone wrong is, is a kind of second best argument, which is to say that, that um, you know, in principle those benefits exist, uh, but financial openness as a way of interacting with and aggravating uh, domestic market distortions or domestic regulatory distortions uh, that results in rather um, uh, 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 unpleasant uh, consequences. Uh, so weaknesses in prudential regulations, weaknesses in domestic contract enforcement, and potential uh, uh, Dutch disease effects because of, let's say, positive externalities in, in tradable markets mean that when you open up your financial uh, to financial globalization, uh, you can have all kinds of things happen. The volatility of your economy goes up, propensity to financial crisis uh, goes up, and capital starts to move uh, rather than from, instead of from poor to rich, from rich to poor countries, from uh, in the reverse direction, from poor to, to rich countries. All of these are understandable now uh, in the context of these sort of uh, current generation uh, 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 models in economics that explain the 
the various uh, syndromes of financial, financial globalization. Uh, but it's not just, uh, so this is, you know, again, historically, if we go back, we see there is a very clear, <coughs> clear association between periods of uh, high degrees of capital mobility and propensity to financial crises. Uh, the gold standard was a period of uh, significant financial crisis. The, 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 uh, the um, most recent period have been the, has been the same. Uh, there's more interesting work recently, empirical work, turning now to the redistributive effects of financial uh, opening or financial globalization. And this work comes out, interestingly, uh, out of the IMF. And a, a series of papers from the IMF uh, research department have shown that countries that open up uh, uh, to, financial, to financial globalization um, experience significant, um, um, significant um, uh, deterioration uh, in uh, equality, in income e equality, and that's true regardless of whether you look at the Gini coefficient, you look at the share of the top 1% or the top 10% in total income, or if you look at the labor share of income. So you know, there's all possible measures of income inequality, opening up the foreign capital tends to be associated with adverse distributional implications. Uh, there are different mechanisms that potentially have created this. Uh, of course, mobility of capital allows capital both to reap higher rewards as well as to shift the distributional incidence of shocks to the domestically mobile uh, uh, labor, uh, but also global tax competition, the, mobility, the competition of states and governments for globally mobile capital uh, has resulted in a global decline of corporate tax rates. Uh, the last round of this, of course, was in the United States, where the reduction in corporate tax rates were explicitly motivated and sold uh, as uh, the consequence of having to compete in the global market, that the United States had to reduce its corporate tax rates uh, in a global environment where other countries um, uh, had re reduced theirs. Uh, so the, the explicitly the tax competition uh, uh, argument. Um, so, uh, so this is all the, the, the set of, of um, economic arguments, reasons, and evidence that uh, much of which uh, I think uh, could have been easily predicted and explains, I, helps, ex help, helps explain, I think, not just the, the distributional tensions that globalization creates, but also how these distributional tensions tend to be aggravated uh, at, the, at the advanced levels of globalization and how they have been aggravated by the type of trade agreements uh, that we actually have, have, have chosen to sign. After all, uh, you know, um, you know, just to go back to corporate uh, tax competition, there's nothing that suggests that when governments get together to sign trade agreements, they should be signing agreements on intellectual property rights, which has very little sense, uh, and, and, and why they spend all their political capital and negotiating capital on that, as opposed to, for example, signing agreements that would uh, um, reduce subsidy and tax competition for international capital, uh, where, in fact, the economic gains are clear, um, and there is a clear uh, uh, inter-country externality that could be internalized through international coordination. Yet, of course, in so many rounds of, of international uh, trade negotiations, bilateral or global or regional, uh, this issue of uh, negotiating um, restrictions on global tax and subsidy competition on, on mobile capital has never really been seriously uh, uh, considered. So this is just an ex example of how uh, sort of it's, it's, it's not just that globalization uh, is uh, just a sort of a, a, a fixed uh, given thing that has fallen on our laps purely by uh, advances in information and communication technology. It also has taken a particular form uh, that has aggravated uh, concerns about who is benefiting, who is writing the rules, um, and um, uh, uh, who uh, actually um, uh, gets to sit in the negotiating table. So, uh, essentially, you can think about everything that I've said so far uh, as being largely the demand side uh, of populism, that, that, you know, that whether it's sort of income effects, whether it's the fears about the race to the bottom, uh, whether it's concerns about uh, uh, national autonomy, uh, these are, uh, are essentially create uh, a sense of not just economic anxiety and discontent and loss of legitimacy on the part of the elites and governments and raise fairness concerns, but these are don't necessarily come with uh, 
explicit uh, culprits uh, or explicit narratives uh, about who is to blame and how to fix it. And I think it's the supply side of politics. Uh, in other words, the, the complaints are there, the anxiety is there, uh, but it, it, it doesn't come fully formed. Uh, it is inchoate. Uh, um, and I think you need the institutional and the supply side of politics to provide a frame, to provide an explanation. And that's what I think polit pol politicians, political leaders, uh, um, and, and, and parties provide. They provide uh, narratives, they provide explanations, and they provide remedies uh, that uh, help channel this discontent. And I think this is where the supply side of, of politics or, or, or the, uh, of, pol of populism in particular comes in. Uh, I think essentially to, to, to simplify, but I think to simplify in a helpful way, uh, we can think of, of politicians, uh, populist politicians, uh, in, in, in two different forms. Uh, we can think of them uh, essentially either exploiting a kind of an income or a social class cleavage so you can think about going back to the original American populist, that was very much a kind of left-wing populism because the main cleavage, your main enemy, you know, what is it that populists do? They claim to speak for the people. They claim to represent for the people. And the question is, who is the enemy of the people? So that's a question of where does the cleavage get drawn? Who is the people and who is not the people? And, and for uh, left-wing populists, uh, the people are those who are left behind by uh, policy choices that have been made by elites. And the culprit uh, are the financial and corporate elites who write the rules. Um, and the original populism, the US populism, was of that form because the, the culprit uh, were the financial elites uh, um, of the United States in New York and, and the Northeast. Um, and that was how the original populist movement um, uh, uh, um, uh, developed. It wasn't really about a cultural backlash. It wasn't defined in terms of what I would call now a right-wing populism, which uh, revolves much more around ethno-nationalistic or, 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 uh, or racial uh, kind of a, a, a cleavage that makes a distinction between the people and uh, the not people uh, on uh, cultural grounds, or on ethnic, racial, linguistic, uh, ethno-nationalistic, or, 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 or racial grounds. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of sort of these different types of, of populism, uh, as you know, I mean, here in, the, in, in Europe, uh, most uh, of the uh, current wave of populism has taken the right-wing form. So if we distinguish between two parts of the world, uh, Europe, and Latin America, and Latin America is there because Latin America has a very long history of populism. In fact, as you can see from this picture, uh, the rise of populism in Europe is very recent, but populism has always been there uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, but the other big difference between Europe and Latin America uh, is that in Latin America, traditionally populism has been of the left-wing variety. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, enemies of the people have been the financial and corporate elites, Washington, um, the IMF and the World Bank, right? Uh, that's the kind of, of um, uh, populism that's more associated with the few countries <coughs> in Europe which have suffered from the Euro crisis the most, such as Spain and Greece, where populism also to a large extent has taken a left-wing form, where again, it's in opposition to Brussels, is it opposition to the European version of financial globalization, actually very similar uh, to Latin America. But in other parts of Europe, uh, as you can see, it's, it's mostly, it's, 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 it's right-wing, uh, so it revolves much more around a kind of a, a, a right-wing or a ethno-nationalistic uh, uh, cleavage. Um, I would hypothesize that I think the, the shape, the form that this populist response takes on the supply side uh, is driven a lot by the, uh, by the nature of the most salient, most salient cleavages uh, that are close to the personal experience of individuals in these societies. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it, tends to become, it tends to be much easier to mobilize along the ethno-national or, or the cultural cleavage uh, when uh, the, in the immediate experience of individuals, the globalization shock takes the form mainly of others that don't look like you, immigration and, and refugees. And then you can have a story about how immigrants and refugees are the problem because they're 
making claims on public housing, on the welfare state, on public resources, and therefore are part of the source uh, of the economic uh, difficulties of the native population. On the other hand, I think it's much easier to mobilize along uh, the income social class cleavage that supports a left-wing variety of populism when globalization shock uh, is, is felt mainly through trade, uh, mainly in terms of a financial crisis where the main, the, the main culprits are seen financial interests uh, and in the form of foreign investment uh, that comes from major uh, metropolitan centers uh, uh, abroad. And that's what I suggested was essentially uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the populism in Latin America, the original populism in the United States, and to a large extent Greece and and, 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 and Spain um, uh, uh, these days as well. The United States today is a bit is interesting. Uh, and the United States is one of the few cases where we have seen very strong right-wing and left-wing populist movements in the 2016 election. Um, uh, if you think about Bernie Sanders as the left-wing variety uh, of, of, of populism and, and Trump the right-wing variety. And it's interesting that you had two very strong populists on both sides of the political spectrum, because in many ways, uh, you know, the United States exhibits a mix uh, of, of these kinds of, of uh, uh, cleavages and shocks, that there was a trade with Mexico and China, NAFTA were very big issues, uh, so were uh, issues about uh, immigrants, um, the threat of uh, Muslim terrorism, and, and so on, uh, which Trump uh, ably uh, exploited. Um, just to compare, for example, in terms of the relative salience uh, of these different types of cleavages, uh, just comparing two European countries, Spain and France, um, uh, and this shows you, this table shows you the, uh, the, uh, the host, the source country composition of migrants or immigrants uh, in Spain versus France. Now, um, I was a little bit surprised to actually find out, I'm sure most of you know this uh, better than I do, uh, that if you look at the total, total stock of immigrants uh, as a share of the domestic population, uh, in fact, there is higher share of immigrants in Spain uh, than in France. But the big difference uh, is that um, in France, uh, more than half uh, of the um, immigrants come from predominantly Muslim countries or sub-Saharan African countries or other developing countries where it's much easier to observe who the other is, uh, either from the, the way that their, their cultural practices, the way they dress, or the color of their skin. So it's much easier to draw that, 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 that line. Uh, in, in Spain, uh, by contrast, the bulk of the um, uh, immigrants actually come from Latin America, uh, and, uh, and the developed part of Europe, or Eastern Europe, where, uh, in fact, the differences are, are much, the cultural and religious differences are, are, are much, much, much less notable. Uh, and I think uh, that clearly has played a significant role in, in the shape of uh, uh, the relative strength of, of different types of populist movements uh, in these uh, two countries. There's a more uh, systemic empirical work uh, along these lines that Luigi Guizzo um, and others have done that, that try to look more systematically uh, at the determinants of these two different types of, of uh, uh, cleavages in shaping the form of, of populism. Uh, I'll just mention the work, uh, but not, not go into it, that is broadly supportive uh, of, of, this, of this idea. So let me just, let me just uh, um, end here. I've, I've laid out a whole bunch of problems. Uh, when I wear a different hat, uh, I talk also a lot about sort of ideas about um, how to move forward and what kind of globalization should we want um, and what's the best way to address uh, these, uh, these, 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 these populist uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, issues um, and maybe in, in, the, in the question and answer period some of that will come up too. But here I just want to, to uh, end by, by putting out in very broad terms um, three kinds of, of scenarios that, that's sort of possible for the future and where I think uh, we might actually end up. Uh, clearly the bad, uh, the worst scenario uh, is a kind of, of um, return to a 1930s style uh, upheaval of both the international uh, order as well as, as domestic political upheaval. Um, I don't think this is a likely scenario uh, and I, not just because 
Uh, there is a general recovery in the uh, advanced industrial countries because I think obviously the conjuncture, economic conjuncture, plays uh, into the relative strength of populism. Uh, but ultimately, as I've suggested, the problem here is more structural uh, than simply uh, one that is related to the business cycle. Uh, much more importantly, I think we have learned a lot and have done a lot since the 1930s that makes, I think, that kind of collapse much less likely. Uh, for all their problems, uh, you know, the, there is a welfare state today that really takes off the edge of much of the, the worst of the economic anxieties that people experience. In that way, the 1930s was completely different. Uh, uh, and also, for all these problems, uh, we have a system of uh, international agreements, international organizations that's much stronger than what we had back in the 1930s. Uh, and finally, I, I would say that for all of its, um, pr for all of its problems, the overall political elites, in strength, uh, political elites that support openness and globalization still are by and large remarkably powerful uh, in the advanced industrial countries. So despite the rise of populism, we actually don't see that the political economy equilibrium that favors globalization uh, has fundamentally changed. And I think we see this very clearly in the United States where a lot of people were concerned that Trump would be the end of uh, open trade policies in the United States. Some people are still are, uh, but I actually don't think it's just going to happen because anytime he really tries to shake up the system in ways that are largely negative, I might add, uh, he gets reined in uh, because uh, you know, he also is reined in by uh, a number of interests, um, even within his own uh, um, cabinet and his, in his own administration uh, that represents uh, a largely pro-trade, pro-globalization uh, kind of, of um, uh, uh, equilibrium. Uh, there is an ugly version of an outcome, uh, which, if you will, is not um, uh, a complete total collapse, uh, but sort of a kind of a, uh, you know, creeping populism and protectionism uh, that is gradually eroding uh, not just an open world economy, uh, but much more uh, dangerously uh, a, the sort of norms of liberal democracy. Um, and I should say that that by far is the, is the greatest danger. And I, I do think that, that, you know, if we don't tackle our problems uh, seriously, that this is a quite a plausible scenario, that I, I don't think that we can write this off, uh, despite what ha appears to be, uh, perhaps not Italy with the elections uh, coming up, but what happens, you know, sort of outside Italy at least, a, a general sense that the populist might be uh, in retreat. Um, I would warn against complacency uh, on, on that front. Um, for me, a, a kind of a desirable scenario, one that puts the genie back in the bottle, if you will, uh, is one that I call sort of a, a democratic rebalancing, uh, a rebalancing of the global economy or the model of globalization uh, that puts much less <laughs> emphasis on the interest of uh, uh, corporate, uh, mo mobile corporations, pharmaceutical companies, uh, international financial institutions, uh, banks, uh, and much more emphasis on, on labor rights and social rights and, and uh, guards against social dumping uh, and addresses uh, legitimate grievances, not just in terms of, of, of uh, income inequality, uh, but also in terms of rules and national self-determination um, that um, I think I would argue uh, might seem like a step back uh, from the kind of hyper-globalization we've experienced in the last couple of decades, but actually has a greater chance of sustaining uh, an open world economy uh, by uh, recreating uh, the social compacts and the social understanding uh, that gave us the open world economy in the first place. Because let's not forget uh, that the flowering of the world economy during the Bretton Woods era was enabled precisely uh, by its national and domestic counterparts of uh, extensive social safety nets and, and social regulatory social bargains uh, that uh, not simply uh, um, uh, provided for insurance and, 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 and ease off the economic anxieties, but also gave the sense uh, that uh, the rules of the world economy uh, were subservient uh, to domestic social contracts and not the other way around. And I think the, the, the big risk and the danger that our current model of globalization has done is precisely um, either actually do so or give the appearance 
of making domestic social contracts and domestic social preferences um, a adjunct uh, to how you, what you need to do in order to compete or become part of the global economy. And I think that reversal of priorities, I think, is going to be essential uh, if we're going to uh, move back towards a, 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 a more sane uh, international economic political order. Thank you. Thank you.